Thanks, David. I hope you're all managing the heat out there. I feel like I'm about to pass out, but hopefully we'll get through this. So, yeah, as, uh, as David mentioned, uh, I founded Evnex around three years ago, and the real vision around this company has been providing uh, improved charging infrastructure for electric vehicles uh, that's going to um, move with the times, essentially, and uh, enable us to control electric vehicle charging stations for uh, demand response perspective. And, and also provide data from charging stations and other home energy using devices um, back to uh, other parties that need them, uh, like retailers and uh, home automation products. So uh, my first introduction to eVelocity was a couple of years ago, and uh, this is uh, my electric car, which is actually just parked out here. It's a Honda Accord, and it was probably one of the first uh, maybe 20 electric vehicles in New Zealand. And, uh, converted alongside uh, John Spence down there who, who did his uh, zone vehicle at a similar time. And so this is, uh, does a, it's got a 20 kilowatt hour battery pack and its performance is pretty similar to Innocent Leaf. Uh, and when I finished this project it was really when I realised that there was a massive opportunity coming up with, with charging infrastructure and was, uh, was yeah, the start of the dream really. So first I thought I should just talk about why do we actually need an electric vehicle charging station. A lot of people think that uh, you probably should just be able to plug an electric vehicle straight into the wall and uh, in many cases that, that would work out but an electric vehicle charging station is really uh, required for a few reasons and the primary one is safety. So there's a, a whole lot of different types of electric vehicles as you've already heard today and, and many of them have different charging requirements. So. Uh, first and foremost, an electric vehicle charging station allows, uh, communicates with the vehicle and essentially tells the vehicle how much power it's able to draw. Uh, so that's really important. So if you, if you uh, pulled up with a brand new Tesla and tried to plug it, plug it into a 10 amp power socket or something like this, then it would blow it straight away. Uh, so it's, it's about power negotiation first and foremost. Uh, secondly, electric vehicle charging stations have quite a lot of capability around uh, protection, so they have uh, residual current devices inside and, and overcurrent protection and things like that. So you can actually just take an electric vehicle charging station plug and drop it in a bucket of water and you'll be completely safe. Uh, so this is, yeah, it's, uh, they're expensive devices at the moment because the volumes are still relatively low, but uh, yeah, they're going to be really important in the future as, as more and more people that know less and less about what's actually happening in an electric vehicle uh, are plugging them in and using them. So just to talk about the AC plug standards and really the, the goal around uh, any technology should be standardisation and uh, we've come uh, a reasonable way with, with the plug standards but there's still a couple of different types. So uh, down the left here we've got the, the Type 1 connector which is uh, primarily used in USA and Japan. So the USA doesn't really use three phase so they use a split phase which is 120 20 volts which adds up to to 240 volts in, in some circumstances. Uh, so that's why uh, they've just got the five pin type one connector and that's used uh, a lot across the states in Japan. Uh, Europe is, and, and Australasia has a lot more three phase power available so the standardisation here is typically around the type two plug which has the provision to supply three phases as well. And that can charge it up to 20, uh, well, up to 44 kilowatts in, uh, in some vehicles. And um, unfortunately, uh, down the end there, the, the Chinese standard is essentially pretty much the same as the Type 2 standard, but the polarity of the plug has actually been reversed. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why they've done that, but uh, it makes it a wee bit more difficult for us. But Oh, yes. And, uh, and just on that top picture there, I don't know if you can see it very well, but that just gives a brief summary of some of the uh, control uh, signals that are sent over the charging cable as well. So you've got both your proximity signal which lets the vehicle know uh, when you have um, pressed the trigger and you're about to pull out. So that means as soon as you press the trigger on the charging plug, uh, the vehicle stops uh, requesting the charge straight away. And also the control pilot, which tells the vehicle how much power it's able to draw at any given time. And through that technology, uh, we can uh, do smart charging essentially and vary uh, the, the signal over that line. Uh, so if there's a large amount of demand on the network, uh, we can change that signal so that the vehicle stops charging uh, period, um, temporarily. Yes. 
So AC versus DC charging. I'm primarily going to be talking about AC charging, but I'll just go over this quickly. The, uh, the real reason for separating out these two types of um, charging infrastructure is that uh, having uh, DC, AC to DC uh, electricity conversion is quite expensive. So uh, uh, DC charging stations allow you to essentially separate that technology out and enable it to be used uh, with a, a far number of, uh, a larger number of users and, and spread that investment over them. Uh, some vehicles like the Renault Zoe have 44 kilowatt AC charging available, uh, which can be really handy, but uh, typically that can be quite expensive to add to a vehicle. So the problems with charging, and these are, these are primarily problems that we've uh, been looking at over the last couple of years and are looking to address as a company. So electric vehicle charging stations are quite expensive, uh, especially some of the connected ones. There is, there is a reason for this. Uh, as I addressed before, the volumes are still relatively low. Uh, electric vehicles still make up a, a very small amount of the global fleet. And as these volumes increase, uh, charging stations will certainly get cheaper. Um, but yes, in terms of the cost of charging stations, there is a lot of compliance involved with them as well. And uh, a lot of testing, as, as we've found, uh, that, that's required of charging stations around uh, flammability and all sorts of different compliance because uh, they are a relatively uh, you know, safety uh, important device and, and they could even be classified by WorkSafe as a high risk device uh, which certainly adds some cost from a manufacturing perspective. So the second problem here is lack of connectivity and we had a chat to a bunch of different drivers in Christchurch and 79% of them said that they uh, would like more connectivity between their charging stations and the electricity companies. And the reason for this is, uh, there's a number of reasons for this. So the screenshot there is, is a Flick app and uh, Flick's a really interesting company and a lot of electric vehicle drivers is, as far as I'm aware are actually on Flick. Uh, Flick uh, passes on the spike price of electricity to the end user. And, and that means that if you've got an electric vehicle and you're able to time your charging uh, to that really low spot price, which is typically overnight, uh, you can actually save quite a lot of money. And having automation around these services is really important. So uh, we're working on uh, automating uh, the, the charging times with the spot prices. So uh, dynamically monitoring those spot prices and, uh, and starting or stopping charging depending on where they are. And the final one is control complexity. So more and more businesses are looking at integrating uh, electric vehicles into their fleets and, uh, and are not sure how to get data back from those vehicles or from the charging stations and, uh, and want uh, yeah, more information as well to, to build up business cases for uh, buying more electric vehicles. And, and through our platform, we enable uh, data to be pulled out of charging stations and provided back to those companies uh, so they can do further analysis. Sorry. There we go. So I just want to talk for a second about IoT for good. So I think today we talk about a lot about connecting devices to the internet and that's not always a good thing. So IoT or Internet of Things has been talked about quite a lot over the last few years and, and it's been hyped up a lot. And all sorts of things have been connected to the internet. Um, dog feeders, uh, here we've got a couple of examples. Uh, an egg tray that tells you how many eggs you've got in your fridge. And uh, the Juicero, which is a company, uh, the one up the top there, uh, that's a US company that raised $120 million in funding for uh, connecting a juice machine to the internet and uh, have since become bankrupt. So many of these products really do provide questionable value. And I think it's important to realise that we're building all this stuff, but the data centres that run them uh, use a huge amount of power as well and data centres are actually responsible for around 2% uh, of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we really need to be, yeah, we believe that we really need to uh, use IoT effectively and that's what we're doing with smart charging. And the final point there is really around, yeah, so all these devices are producing a lot of data, more and more data has been produced by all these IoT devices, but we need ways of effectively doing things with that data, uh, because it's no use if we're not pro uh, providing meaningful information from it. So that's where uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to come in very useful as well. 
So, why smart charging? Uh, I think uh, Orion is going to talk a wee bit later about what's, uh, what they're doing across their network, but this is just a bit of an example of something that happened this year and is, is fairly typical across most networks around the world. And this is when Orion was uh, essentially pretty close to their, or was, was going to be far over their network capacity. And they were sending out a message across their ripple control network to switch off hot water cylinders all across Christchurch. And as you can see here, uh, they were at 100% load shedding capacity. So that means uh, Christchurch Hospital probably would have been running on diesel generators and essentially all the hot water cylinders across Christchurch that they could switch off uh, were already switched off. And a lot of situations like this come about because the national grid, uh, Transpower, will be uh, requesting alliance companies to, to cut their demand because uh, in this case Transpower probably just physically couldn't get enough power in through the feeders into Christchurch. So why do we care about this? Well, every time we reach these limits, the cost of electricity and the tariffs on our network increase. Uh, so th there's certainly a cost incentive for us to avoid using electricity at peak times. But also, and this is not such an issue in New Zealand, but environmentally in many other countries, when we reach conditions like this, we need to increase generation to meet the demand. And often that generation comes from uh, peaking power stations uh, like uh, coal and gas generation. So if we can avoid using that and shift it onto times when uh, renewable generation is still available, uh, then it's far better off for everyone. So the energy market's changing. I talked before about Flick and, and how they're passing on the spot price to consumers. And we think this is really exciting. So I think for a long time, uh, the consumer hasn't had a lot of choice about where the electricity comes from, but with new technologies like batteries and solar and electric vehicle uh, storage, uh, things are gonna start changing. And, and that change, is, we think, is primarily going to happen around the decentralisation of energy. So this is a screenshot out of a white paper from an Australian company called Powerledger. And Powerledger is a company that is uh, building essentially a blockchain network for buying and selling energy. And, and when I talk about blockchain, I'm talking about uh, essentially what's a digital currency. It's a cryptocurrency. And the, real, uh, the amazing thing about these currencies, these blockchain technologies, is it enabling us to uh, cut out the, essentially the retailers or, or the uh, entities that are there uh, just for, for clearing uh, these energy um, buying and, and uh, these sales. So the way that PowerLedger sees it, and, uh, and we, we really agree with this, is that uh, the, the energy industry of the future, there's going to be uh, the, the consumer is going to have a lot more choices around how they generate and consume energy. So uh, they're going to have uh, potentially Tesla power walls uh, or battery storage in their house. They're going to have electric vehicles that may be uh, delivering energy back into the grid. And uh, they're going to potentially have solar energy generation as well. So maybe often the generator won't even need to be involved. Maybe if you've got solar panels, uh, you can just uh, use this blockchain technology to buy energy straight off your neighbour and it effectively just goes straight through uh, your local network without actually even getting back onto the main network. And, uh, and there's a lot of, yeah, there's going to be some big changes happening around this. So just to talk a wee bit about our solution. So as I touched on before, there were some key problems that we saw around charging infrastructure, which was cost uh, and, and connectivity primarily. So we've developed a, a new ecosystem of products that connects charging stations to the internet and uh, can also manage other energy users uh, around the home, like uh, hot water cylinders and spa pools and things like that. And we're connecting all these devices through the internet, uh, through the cell network. So this is our, our charging station over to the left here, and um, we build this using a uh, very modular architecture, uh, which can be used, as I say, to control uh, other devices around the home as well. And we're also, as part of this, building a software platform uh, that we will be providing to, to companies uh, potentially that might be running their own fleets. So, um, you know, a company that might maybe is doing a courier company or something like that that wants to have some more information about how much energy their vans are using. Uh, we're going to be providing the software to uh, utilities that are going to be managing large numbers of these devices across their networks. 
and also the software is going to be able to provide a whole bunch of data back through APIs as well. Uh, and that, you know, that can be used by retailers, for example, if they want to show uh, some charging data in their, in their consumer app. So where's the future going uh, for AC charging? Well, wireless charging is probably not quite there yet. And so this is the, uh, the, the plugless charger, which is probably the, the most popular one in the world. That's a US company. The, the two primary con, uh, concerns around this technology is efficiency and uh, EMF radiation. And, and some people are more concerned about the EMF radiation than others, but essentially what's happening there is an inductive power transfer link, and there's, uh, there's a lot of power potentially being transferred through these, so there's potential for uh, these you know, really strong magnetic fields uh, to be uh, essentially being generated around the vehicle when it's charging, and, and I think there's still a lot more work to be done around the science to, for us to know whether or not that's going to be an issue, but uh, the more closely that we couple the charging pad to the vehicle, uh, the less that's going to be an issue. Uh, the second problem, as I said, is, is around efficiency. So this plugless charger here is about 12% less efficient than an equivalent 30 amp uh, tethered charging station. And you know, I think when we look at the reasons for going to electric vehicles, uh, efficiency is a really important one. And I think you can argue that for the sake of uh, you know, uh, 10 seconds plugging your vehicle and when you get into the garage it's probably worth doing that to save that power but going forward there's been a lot, uh, a lot of advances in this uh, technology. Uni services out of Auckland uh, and, and Power by Proxy out of Auckland that just got bought by Apple has been doing a lot of work in this technology and uh, I, I certainly think that in the future it probably will end up being um, the, the main charging technology. Uh, ISO 15118 8 is also another standard that's going to come out well, has come out and I think is, is mandated uh, in all vehicles being built now. And that's going to enable digital communication between a charging station and an electric vehicle. And what that means is that when you turn up, you can essentially um, plug in or, or just drive over the pad if it's wireless, and you won't need to use an RFID card or use an app to pay for parking. Uh, so that's going to be a huge improvement as well uh, for consumers and especially for public charging. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, as I say, I sort of didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this, but very happy to take uh, any questions if, uh, if anyone would like to know more. Sorry? Sure, so the question, the question was what is our setup around the South Island at the moment? Uh, it's a really good question. So we are still developing products at the moment and our product is likely to be certified uh, March, April next year, um, after which case we'll be rolling out uh, into New Zealand and Australia. Uh, we've got um, yeah, prototypes, but we haven't, uh, we still need to do certification, so we haven't sold anything yet. Yeah. Um, are you building the charge stations? The charging stations? Yes, yeah. yeah, so. Uh, I've got a question. Why, why are all these charge stations not uh, having an access point for bicycles, electric bicycles? There's far more electric bicycles than there are electric cars. Yeah, I think it's a really... Uh, so the question was, why are charging stations not including uh, the provision for charging electric bicycles? My, my thoughts around that is that the technology required to charge and, and the power required to charge an electric bicycle is far less uh, than a vehicle and, and typically there's not the safety issues around it. So certainly in New Zealand it's been mandated that you can't have uh, just a standard 10 amp uh, socket uh, being exposed in a public place for charging an electric vehicle uh, because of, of the large amounts of power. But I think that my understanding anyway is that that would still be fine for an electric bike. So I think probably what would happen if, if, you know, if there is a requirement for that, and I agree there probably is, is that just a standard maybe waterproof 10 amp socket would be provided next to a, a vehicle charging station for, for bikes to plug in. I mean there isn't a standardised plug for electric bikes yet, and I'm not sure if, if there will be, but as I understand typically they would just come with their own kind of charge cord that you would plug into the wall. Yeah, but the uh, ordinary charge takes three, four hours. It's too long. If you're out, if you're out on a trip, it, cyclists have range anxiety as well as people who drive cars. Um, 
some people might want to go a long distance for a day trip. They want to plug it into somewhere just for a few minutes to top it up and then they can go. Yeah, look, I think if there's probably the reason why it hasn't taken off yet is standardisation. Uh, I think well, I, I haven't personally looked into it a lot, but I haven't seen a standard kind of connector for electric bicycles. I know most electric or a lot of electric motorbikes in the US are using the Type 1 J1772 connector, but for electric bicycles, apart from kind of just, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. You're the industry leader, so you lead us. Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly something we could look into, and as I say, we're sort of primarily looking into cars, but I agree there's a lot of sense with uh, electric bicycles and reducing congestion, et cetera, so. Yeah. I was just going to suggest that uh, if you've got a, an electric bike and you're doing all sorts of interesting, going interesting places on it, you actually need a charger in some different places from what you'd charge an electric car in, which is, uh, so you probably need them on rail trails with little sockets and things like that. Um, AA does cover now, I think, um, I think I got asked if I wanted an electric, we haven't got an electric bike, but if you can get an electric bike cover, they'll come out and charge you up if you get stuck, apparently, if you've got the right thing on your AA, so I just... Okay, thanks, yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Cool, no, thank you very much, and look, please feel free to flick me an email, it's um, edit.evnex.com, uh, if you've got any other questions or you'd like to talk about uh, charging stations or anything, so yeah, thanks for your time.